You're listening to Biz Souls, the business podcast with an edge, hosted by me, Rona Lewis, and Jeffrey Hansler. Tune in for perspectives and discoveries about the changing world of business. It's time to connect to the heart, soul, and humor of how business gets done. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biz Souls. I'm Rona Lewis. And I'm Jeffrey Hansler. And, and we get the heart and soul of business and the people that make it happen. One of these days I'll get that right. I'm still I know. Looking it's like he's got one freaking line and he well, can't get it right. But anyway, I, we I have looking at the equipment. That's right. Well, as long as you look at that equipment and not my equipment, we're good. I mean, you can't do both. Not at the same time, anyway. Let me go <laughs> that one. All right. We so have like walking a, and chewing gum or something. You can't do and, and, I, you I, know, I, rubbing your stomach, patting your head, the whole night. Yeah. Actually, I do. I seem to be having trouble with that. I, it, well, anyway, that's rubbing all your tummy. That's a whole different. No, 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 no. Just focus on more than one thing at a time. Well, and, and you shouldn't. All right. We digress. Okay. I want to introduce my friend, Christine Downs, who uh, I've known since, I guess, since I moved here through Donna. Yeah. Donna Graves, Graves. who, uh, she, yeah, she and I went to college together and you work with, with her. At, you're the, the official corporate lawyer, right? For them. I am. Uh, I'm in-house counsel for in Encompass International, which is a marketing company here in LA, which is, yeah. I always say the coolest marketing company. They ever. really are. I love They're them. They're so I'm, awesome. Uh, I, I've been dying to get Donna on here and she won't do it. You're kidding. A bitch won't do it. Yeah. Well, well actually, that. that's not going to help, Abrona. Now that's it. She knows. She knows. I should get Donnie on here. Oh, Donnie will talk your ear off, as you know. I know. But Donna's a little more reserved. She is. Yeah. She is, and she's. No, I'm very, a, a very, very fortunate to work for that company. They're amazing. It's founded by two dynamic women. Yes. Who have created this business from scratch, and I'm I'm happy to be their in-house corporate lawyer. And and, and you are uh, so much more. You are so much more. I'm going to actually read your official bio that I, I think I got. I said I got it from, from the website. Okay. Um, Christine Downs is a writer, which is why we're here today. We're going to talk about your new book, lawyer, animal lover, world traveler, history buff, avid reader, fan of dragons. Me too. Sci-fi and fantasy, Gemini. Jeffrey, aren't you a Gemini rising? Enthusiastic wine drinker. Me too. <laughs> Amateur sculpture, collector of art and random things, music lover, reluctant cook, aspiring gym rat, Chicago native, dog and cat mom, Los Angeles resident, sarcastic optimist, an occasional cynic, and still evolving. You don't have time to do anything else. Yeah. With all these things. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. That's that's like the fun version of me. Well, you I'm, are fun. You're very yeah, fun. I well, you know, I try. I think it's important. So yeah, I would say that, you know, I've I've been mostly an attorney and mm -hmm. a writer through my, you know, whole career. Right. I did both kind of simultaneously from the very beginning. And I was a litigator at first. I was a criminal prosecutor in the Chicago area. And I prosecuted child abuse cases for a number of years and then I switched to litigation. And then when I moved to LA, I moved to pursue screenwriting. And the first year I was in LA, I won the Nickel Fellowship, which is wow. a big screenwriting competition, if you haven't heard of it, that's, that's sponsored or programmed through the people who do the Oscars. So the Academy of of you know, film, arts and sciences and whatever have created this wonderful screenwriting competition. And it's kind of like a little bit like winning an Oscar for an unproduced screenplay. So that was really nice. fun. Did it ever um, get produced? You know, that script actually has been sold four times and I've gotten it back four times. Oh, so for crying out loud. Yeah, I know. It happens to me a lot, though. I've had a number of, I've won a lot of awards in, in screenwriting and I've sold a lot of scripts, but, you know, they get optioned and then they come back, you know, like the option runs out they and I get it back. So I continue to get paid for it, but I really would love someday for them they to got, actually yeah. make the movie. You don't have to give the money back, do you? No, they give it back. Oh, all right, that's no, it's on them. You know, they they option it for a, a period of time, and right. then when the option lapses, if they don't renew it, and usually what happens is, you know, whoever is in the production company that's optioning it has, you know, is whoever was championing it and was a fan of it ends up 
either getting fired or moving to another place or whatever. And so oh, it kind of just goes on a shelf. So if yeah. you don't have someone kind of advocating for your script, it can happen. Okay. Um, well. So, you know, I'm not complaining, but, you know, I would love to see one of them actually made someday. And, but, you know, my life's not over. So. No, absolutely. And you have other projects, which is what we're here to talk about today. We love, we digress and we love that. We're going to talk about your new book, and first, we always start with this question, which Jeffrey is going to ask you now. Go ahead, Jeffrey, ask your question. Okay. Did you always want, when you were little, did you want to grow up and want, did you want to be a lawyer when you grew up? Or a writer. And a writer. A writer. I did not necessarily want to be a lawyer. I kind of started thinking about that in high school. And then when I went to college, I knew that I was going to go to law school. And I don't remember why exactly. I just think that it occurred to me that being a lawyer would be a great career. And, you know, so that's what I did. And did you grow up? Um, well, a lot of people do that. Yeah. Did you grow I up? I did not Chicago? grow up with lawyers. I didn't grow up around lawyers. Like there was really nothing. I just think that I just kind of, I think I knew, you know, because I, I don't have a problem public speaking and, you know, I was in speech, you know, in, in high school and stuff. So I think like, I think that was kind of in the, the universe around me where the people were like, oh, you'd be a good lawyer, like, you know, things like that are mentioned. So I, that's my best guess. But I always knew I would be a writer. Always. When I was in third grade, I stayed after school with my teacher and she helped me write my first book. And it was about horses or something. I don't even know what happened to it, honestly. Um, but I knew like I have always been just this avid reader and I was very into horses as a kid and so, and had horses. And so that I read every book that ever had to do with a horse that was in the entire library. And so that of course was the first thing I started writing, but I, I always had that in me and I don't know where it comes from, but if you are a writer, like a true writer at spirit, I think that you're kind of driven to tell stories. So that was always me. Well, and it's, uh, kind of, I mean, it's, it, it's a, that's a good match. Like, Clive Cussler uh, was a lawyer and then became a writer. And there are right. several more that. Uh, well, so we had Paul Levine on. Right. Friend Paul from, exactly. Yeah. So he's, I, I was telling Christine about him. That he was, he's a best selling mystery writer and, and all that. So yes. There are, awesome. there are a lot of lawyers that end up writing because you write a lot, most lawyers anyway, not all of them. Yeah. You write a lot as a lawyer. You're writing briefs and you're writing motions and things. And it, it does help you organize your thoughts. And so, I think it's helpful at career wise as to kind of prep you for other things in writing. So, so, so yeah, well, I just yeah. I just came out with my little book. Yes, uh, Dragon Queen. It's very Barbie pink. <laughs> it's very cute. It is. So wait, so so I'm not not really me. I'm more of a tom girl, uh, you know, tomboy. But I just love this color. Like I don't know, it just spoke to me at the time. So um, so how, tell us how you got like to this to the point of Dragon Queen. You became a lawyer. Tell us your tell us your life story in like three minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, the bullet points are as I, I had mentioned to you. I moved to LA to pursue screenwriting. I also have started a novel that I'm working on now that hopefully will be out this year. And meanwhile, I have a niece, Kiana, who's mentioned in the book. The book is dedicated to her. She turned 17 this year. And I was thinking to myself about when I was 17 and some of the things I wish I had known mm -hmm. at that age, if I had had a, a mentor or, you know, someone who could have given me, given me advice at the time, what would I want to know? And so I started just writing the book for her. And that is really what I did. I wrote, I wrote the book thinking, oh, what, what would I like to tell her? And so after I finished it, a few people that I knew read it and said, you know, you really should publish this. Like, this isn't just something for, for your niece. Like so many people would love this type of advice. And the first thing I thought was, well, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a you know, a professional coach or anything like that. You know, what business do I have giving people advice? But I quickly decided that all people have advice to give. You know, all you don't have to be a psychiatrist. You can say, here's what I've learned. And you can listen to me or not listen to me. It's, that's okay if you reject what I have to say. But, you know, and it's not a replacement for therapy or any other thing. Right. But I think that a lot of women 
have great advice to give to other women and we should all share it out there. So that's kind of what I decided to do. Like, well, and it's meant like, to be a fun project. Like it's well, not, it yeah, it's meant to be fun because it's premised upon the idea that every woman has an inner dragon and you are the queen of your dragon and you can unleash your dragon and call on your dragon when you need that kind of inner strength and, when you need to, con My yeah, when you need to connect with yourself and, you know, create your vision for your life. So, okay. Are we, are we talking Puff the Magic Dragon or are we talking Game of Thrones Dragon? <laughs> well, so let's burn the town. <laughs> I mean, listen, you can, you can decide what your dragon is. Mine is definitely not Puff the Magic Dragon. Right. Mine is definitely a level a town if I really unleashed it. <laughs> I believe me. So, that surprised me. Yeah. But, you know, part of the book is is about learning how to control that. It doesn't have yeah. to be so fierce. You know, you can it's nice to have that power, but you don't unleash it unless you really need to. It's it's you know, there is a way of of living with dignity. Yeah. So it does yeah. talk about that as well. So, so I noticed Rona's in your book cover pink. And yes, I am. Uh, there you go. So is that, you know, <laughs> could have been planned. Mean. And Ruth, Ruth, the creator of Barbie, couldn't she, she could have probably used your services. She got in trouble with the SEC, didn't she? Yeah, and she had to, they they kicked her off the, you know, off out of the company because of it. So yeah. But we know she was great though. She really fought for it. So she had she was she's a tough cookie. Yeah. Yeah. Tough. I mean, especially in the in the era that she when she did that, which is, you know, still not many women were really in the work force other than as secretaries or teachers or nurses or what have you, yeah. you know, to, to be involved in a company was challenging. And, you know, that is also another part of this book, which is, you know, you have to, you have to decide that you belong in the place that you want to claim. You have to put yourself in that room. And I think, you know, bravo to her that she had the inner strength to be able to do that, even though obviously it didn't last. But, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a matter of creating the space and entering the space that you think you belong in. So good for her. You know, it's I I, I wish I I had this this book. I, I teach a class. I, I teach a women's leadership certification class. You know, these these women are managers and some of them are VPs, surprisingly, with a large amount of imposter syndrome. And if they, they had a guide like, like this, you know, and I being a New Yorker, you know, I'm, I'm really, I mean, you know me, Christine, I'm pretty straightforward and, you know, and Jeffrey, you know me well enough. That's like, I, you know, I will be as kind as I can be. And, you know, everyone's my friend until they're not. Mm -hmm. And when you're not watch out. That's where my dragon comes out, you know, and, and these women have to realize that they don't have to play by, by men's rules. They have to be their authentic selves. And you, you, you talk about this in your, in, in your book about loving yourself, your, the good, bad, and the, and the ugly. And that's, that's really where you can become a force for good, you know, right? Absolutely. I, I do talk about in the book and one of the, the main things that Dragon Queen is actually a, about is loving yourself first. If you if you really do love yourself, then you will you will make decisions that honor yourself. And so, and you will treat other people in a way that honors your you. Yeah. So, it's it's really about, you know, training yourself to act with dignity and when you when you do that, when you actually find the place to love yourself first, the challenges of being anywhere are lessened because you know that you have that kind of heart and spirit and dignity to fall back on no matter what challenge is coming at you. And it gives you the grace to treat other people with the, you know, the respect and empathy that they need. Yeah. And I do also talk about self-promotion in the book because I think that self-promotion is really hard mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people, men and women, but a lot I think especially with women, yeah. because we are trained from birth to be people pleasers and to kind of smooth over situations and, you know, and not really be confrontational. And I think that what results from that a lot of times is insecurity among women when they are in even in positions of power, but also kind of this, the inner self doubt, you know, should I should I actually 
be trying for this? And, you know, how do you do this? And I can speak from my experience as an attorney years and years ago when I started, I really thought that being a good attorney meant that you were kind of mean and bitchy and difficult. And, you know, like you walk into the room, like, you know, a character on TV. And what I did learn in through the history of, of being an attorney is that you actually get more done if you're nice to people and pleasant and fair. You don't I mean, actually I have to, you know, come in with an attitude to be taken seriously as a woman. You yeah. can, and it, it, it can be harder because, you know, it, you feel unheard a lot of times and you, unheard you know, and, and, and judged on our physical appearance versus how smart we are. Yes. And yeah. And yeah, I mean, and what I have found is that men and women judge women by men's rules. Sure. And that's a, a shame because, I mean, you even mentioned this, that the women are 51% of the workforce, although I think only like 20% are in any kind of upper management. And so, we need to be more. Go so, ahead, Jeffrey. Sorry. Well, with, yeah, yeah, really. I, I, I'm just I'm just arm candy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just podcast candy today. <laughs> so Rona, Rona obviously has trouble promoting herself. She never does it on the podcast. <laughs> So, okay, first of all, the, I mean, and this is related to it. So in terms of the, the, you know, being mean and being, you know, ruthless as a lawyer, the statistically at that time, most of the lawyers were men probably. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so they were the model for that. And, you know, so adopting their model, you know, you, you, you and other men adopt that model as well. So I, I don't, See, I don't, you know, and I always have an issue on this male, female thing. I don't. You just I, have I, issues, Jeffrey. I, I, I have a lot of issues. <laughs> well, and there's spillover, of course. Yeah. I don't, I don't pretend that, that the men in the field of litigation were all sweethearts. They weren't. There were a lot of jerks. Oh, but, absolutely. And I think yeah. it's out of insecurity. I mean, the people that yeah. are like that are insecure, male or female. Right. So, so and what I do you think that's the bottom of it? You have to be very, you have to be confident to be able to be dignified in the way that you act and treat people. And if if you're really coming from a place of aggression all the time, that's really not a, a sign of confidence. That's a sign right. of insecurity. So right. we do talk about that in Dragon Queen. I do, I do think that it's a little more heightened with women. Not that it's not present with men, but with women, because number one, we are physically smaller most of the time. Right. We are not as loud most of the time and not, you know, and still relatively new to whatever workspace you're talking about. And so I do feel like they, they feel like they have to come much hard. They have to come at you much harder to earn their space and, and to be heard. Yeah. And it actually has been studied and proven that, you know, women are interrupted more than men yeah. and, you know, things of that nature in a, in a meeting. And so they are still, we are, st we as women are still combating that. But I think what I'm saying in this book is that you don't have to sink to a certain level. You don't have to bring your dragon's fire to every situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's enough that you know that it's there when you need it. Mm -hmm. And you can choose how you, you know, you bring that out or how you access it. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of the point of it. Not that you, you have to be accommodating all the time. Certainly right. not. You don't, you don't have to be the people pleaser all the time, but it's about kind of creating and owning the space and creating and, and enforcing your boundaries in a way that allows you to be dignified. That um, was my, that was my next point that I want to talk about. You did talk about boundaries there. And women seem to have a lot of issues, problems, however you want to couch it, that uh, with with boundaries, you know, I think there's a lot of conscious or or, or unconscious codependence, you mm -hmm. know, and and so we lose our boundaries or lose the ability to see where our boundaries should be in order to feel good about ourselves. Mm hmm. I would agree. And I, I think it's, you know, of course, it's a moving target for everybody, mm -hmm. for men and women and in relationships, in work and all these things like there's no 
one way to do something that makes it foolproof. And there's no one way to do thing, something that makes it makes you feel good, you know, guarantees that it, everything's working. It's more about kind of a practice of thinking about yourself. And again, starting it from a place where you really love and admire yourself and you really involve yourself in self-care allows you to be the stronger person in the room. It allows you to be the stronger person in any situation basically that comes at you so that you can choose how to deal with it and and decide, you know, make decisions that benefit you and, res- you know, and, and show your self-respect. It's hard. It's hard for me too. I still struggle. I make a point to say at the beginning of this book that I am certainly not a perfect example of anything, really. I don't pretend to be an expert on anything. And, and yes, I struggle. It is hard sometimes to just not get really mad at people, you know, and just think, God, is that stupid? What are you doing? You know, like, yes, of course I have moments like that. And I also, you know, I have moments in my relationship where I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not 100%. I don't even know how to say, you know, to my spouse sometimes what I need or why I'm unhappy. You know, you have to sit and think and you have to spend time with your thoughts and your emotions to be, a you know, the best person that you can be. So it's a practice. It's not you know, nobody's perfect. I don't care what they do. So it's, yeah. yeah well, and it's about reminding yourself. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Life one is not a one and, and done and neither is learning your, your boundaries and, and communication. Absolutely. Cause what life is constantly at, changing, right? I mean, there is no, there's no finish line. There's life is constantly changing as fast as technology changes. Our lives change. Absolutely. So it's right. very chaotic right now. In the world. All over, all over. Yeah. Jeffrey, what's your point? Why are you I'm laughing? I'm laughing because I couldn't get a word in edgewise. From uh, Jeff. Well, you know, you get two women in the room and... and Christine, you are, neither you and I are very quiet. So. <laughs> what I was going to say is when I went, well, I, uh, you, you sent us the text of the book and, and that's what I got from... You know, the overall theme is is it's about discovering yourself and and becoming comfortable and embracing yourself for you know positive and negatives. I didn't take it as a uh, you know this is the way to be. It was it was very much a, a guide to getting in touch with yourself, which is well. And I, I I appreciated that because you weren't you weren't gunning for for the male portion of society. It was just how to how to work with with everybody and and mostly that that comes from the south yes well and i do think that man bashing has gotten to be kind of an olympic sport in in general and i i'm not really in favor of that because the men in my life are wonderful and if they weren't i wouldn't have them in my life so like i don't feel like the men in my life especially my husband who's wonderful like i don't feel like they're oppressing me or trying to you know keep me from living my dreams and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I want I, one of those. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Jeffrey's one of my best but, friends. So I'm, I'm so kidding. <laughs> you know, I, I know women struggle and, you know, it is easy to, to pick on men because, you know, a lot of them it's such an easy target do crazy, you know, they do things that really make us mad, but I also think that's a little bit of a cop out. Like, yes, you hold them responsible when they do something that's bad or wrong or hurtful, but you also have to take responsibility for yourself. You know, you can't you can't sit by idly. You have to work on yourself. You have to envision the life you want and make it happen and not wait for somebody to make it for you. So, you know, I believe that women are strong enough to take on that responsibility. And I think Absolutely. we need to remind ourselves that that is our responsibility. So, so- um, as fun as it can be to, you know, laugh at some memes that are on social media. Right. Um, I, yeah, that's not my go-to. So uh, what were some of the things in your own experience that kind of <clears throat> made you check and say, okay, wait, this is happening to me because I'm a woman, as opposed to this is happening to me because I'm uh, new with it, because there's a pecking order or, and not a male, female pecking order. Like when you're new at something, you just don't have much clout. Um Sure. So what were some of the things that that brought this to attention or what are some of the things you're seeing now that this book is really important? Well, again, I I think it it became important to me to say at this present time, because 
again, my niece inspired it. You know, I have a niece who turned 17. And again, I was trying to think of the things that I wanted her to know. But I do believe it applies to a broader audience because more and more women are in the workplace and struggling between, you know, being moms and being, you know, breadwinners. And and I, I, I just think the society in general is, you know, we're struggling with boundaries in every area of the world, in every area of our lives, from personal to professional. And so, you know, when when women are are in the like again in the boardroom, for example, again we get interrupted more than men do. And so I I think that it's it's a presence that isn't always overwhelming, but it's also something that you do notice. As far as like an example, I can the only thing that I know that I that I absolutely remember was being in a deposition. I probably took a thousand depositions in my legal career. And being in the room where the deposition was going to happen at least 10 times, the, the male attorney would come in the room and assume I was the court reporter because the court re- the reporters were usually women, uh, not so much now, but they were at the time. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm the, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm either co-counsel or I'm, you know, defense counsel or plaintiffs like no. So I think that there's like a, you know, there's an unconscious bias about a lot of things. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's not like I was ever shut down in a in a boardroom in a vicious way that I remember. But there are things like that that are per, per, pervasive and still exist out there just because of the history of our society. You know, women are stepping into roles that they never had before. They're flying, you know, they're flying jets now. They're going to the, you know, they're astronauts. They're doing all these different things. So absolutely, this is a great time for women to kind of revisit their inner spirit and go, you know, what is it that actually we want? Do I want to be CEO? Because if I do, I can. But is that really what I want? Mm -hmm. Um, There's a chapter in here that talks about you really have to ask yourself the difficult questions about, you know, you want something, but do you really? And are you willing to do what it takes to get that thing? Because a lot of times the answer is no. The answer is like, I don't want to go to another 10 years of school or I don't want to do that. Like maybe I'm better where I am. So it's about giving yourself their self-respect and self-love to really sit with yourself and ask those questions. And if you decide you want to be in that room, then do it, you know, make a plan, figure out how to do it and do it because you can claim any space that you want to be in. One more question for me. And so do you think that it's changing generationally? So the younger generation coming up, have are the, are the men better? Do you think that if a young male lawyer went in with a young female lawyer now, that they would assume that she was a court reporter? Or do you think it would be, uh-huh. they would be a little more intelligent on that? Well, I mean, society has definitely changed. I think that would be much less likely now because at least half the lawyers now are women. So, you know, that's been going on long enough. The same with doctors. At least half the doctors are women. And my husband told me a story about when the first physician in his hospital that was a female surgeon, the first one that came into his hospital, this is, of course, years ago, she had nowhere to change because there was a doctor's changing room and a nurse's changing room. And she wasn't a nurse. She was a doctor, but all the men were in the doctor's room. So she went in and changed with the men. She was like, no, I'm not doing that. And good for her, you know? And then of course they've remedied that. And now there's, you know, women's and men's and whatever, but you know, that doesn't exist anymore. So of course it has changed. Yes. And then the younger generation is going to have a different historical experience for sure. So I think that's wonderful. But it doesn't, you know, like that doesn't mean that girls coming up still wouldn't be insecure about something. Of course. Or insecure about something. Oh, sure and about this is too. So even if it was equal and they never had any of those kind of discriminatory experiences, you can still need help finding your confidence and strength. It's a good, you know, this I I think this book, if nothing else, is a great reminder of how powerful. And and dragon like women can can be, right? Of so, course. Yeah. Let's. I want to go on to some 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 tips. What would you give tips to women or or anyone who wants to write a book 
like like this? Well, first of all, write it. Go for it. I I think it's wonderful to put your thoughts down and and you don't, you know, and especially if you have something you really feel like needs to be heard out there. Mm-hmm. The the current environment for publishing is has exploded, of course. Traditional publishing was so difficult and is it continues to be so difficult for so many people to get published just because there's so many people out there who want to get published. And publishing companies have their own agenda, of course, and they want to make sure that they can sell. So I think independent publishing has, of course, changed the the entire spectrum of what's being published now. Every kind of book can be published. I, I, I see so many children's books being published because people exactly. are just doing it. And it and it, it is really difficult to get published, but now you can do it yourself. And you know, I independently published one Tell of the, the problems. Well, what's Hold that? The Hold the book up. My little, you can see right. I independently published. And what you do is you find someone to design your cover. You you can you can go with different publishing, independent publishing houses out there that will do everything for you. Basically, they'll get you an ISBN number. They will format it for you. They will distribute it. And even Amazon has one. Yes, Amazon does. And yeah, and my book is Amazon. My book is on Amazon, of course. And mm-hmm. they, you know, they're one of the biggest, that's how Amazon started with books. Right. And so they're... I believe they're the biggest bookseller in the world. I think so. Um, so yeah, you can, and people can find your book if you decide that you want to advertise it. You know, there are ways of doing advertising on Instagram and Facebook and, and, you know, a million different things to get your, to get the word out about your book. Right. Well, so I, I would say yes, but here's another thing I would say though, make sure you hire an editor. I wouldn't just write it and publish it. Like, you know, do the responsible thing for yourself. Don't set yourself up for failure. Make sure that the book is really well done. There are a lot, if you go on things like Fiverr, you can hire a book editor who will read it and give you notes and do spell checks and all of that stuff. And you can do it for, you know, an affordable price. And you absolutely should do that. You should not ever put it out there without checking it. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice. So how can people contact you, find the book? Tell us all the the contact stuff. Okay. So you can visit my website, which is hellodragonqueen.com. And you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, also at Hello Dragon Queen. And you can go right to Amazon. You can and order it. You can go you just type in Dragon Queen, a guide, and it pops right up and you could order. Right now, it's available in hardback, but the soft cover and the ebook is coming, so that will be that will be up very soon. Right. And I think, you know, like I I've given this book to a number of my friends because I there's just a nice message here about, you know, congratulations, I'm glad you're in my life and I see you and respect you and I want you to know that. And so there's, you know, there there's a little bit of having your gal pals close to your heart, like that was one of the things that I really like about having this and being able to give it to somebody because it's almost like a, you know, yes, there's advice, but it's also a little bit like getting a greeting card where you're like, oh yeah, you see me and appreciate me. That's wonderful. So yeah. Anyway, so hello, Dragon Queen, just find me and check it out. And yeah. Well, you are multifaceted, multi-talented, and you're just a wonderful, wonderful human being. I like you very, very much. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, you and your and you're also generous. I've been to your house a couple of times for holiday meals, which are magnificent. Uh, so thank <laughs> we you. We always have a crowd. We always yes. have, yeah. We always try to have a crowd. It's fun. It's fun and your husband it. makes great potato pancakes. So there you go. <laughs> he does. Yeah, and he spends a lot of time, and he he usually like grading them, like loses the tips of his fingers. Right. Well, thank God he's not a surgeon anymore, because that would be bad. <laughs> He'd be going like this, right? Laboring for the potatoes. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> They're worth it. Well, Christine, thank you so much for being on Biz Souls. I was so excited to read the book and talk to you about it, and I wish you the best of luck with this. We really need it. Our younger generation needs it now. So. I agree. I think the the kids, you know, it's tough being a kid today and they feel very isolated in their social media worlds. So yeah, um, they have to learn a lot. 
but they also are very resilient too. So we'll see what this generation brings. I have, I have great hopes for them. Me too. Fingers crossed. All right. That is it for us. I'm Rona Lewis. I'm Jeffrey Ansler. And this has been Biz Souls. We'll see you next time. Thank you. You've been listening to the Biz Souls podcast with your hosts, Rona Lewis and Jeffrey Hansler. Did you have fun? Subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Talk to you next week.